Oh yeah, that's good, that's good. Perfect. Okay, so uh, today we're talking about sea turtle population abundance and movement studies in Hawaii and also the Pacific Islands region. And I'm trying to have a little bit of fun with this, so I'm not going to go, it's not going to be too dense. Um, just start falling asleep if it is and I'll like, spice it up a little bit. But um, hopefully we can show you a little bit about some of the work that our program is doing at the Pacific Islands Fisheries Science Center. So this is through NOAA Fisheries. So first of all, we're here in Hawaii, so you obviously know where that is, but what do I mean by the Pacific Islands region? The Pacific Islands region, as we define it for NOAA Fisheries, includes the whole Hawaiian archipelago and also the Marianas archipelago, which has the Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands, or I'll just call it CNMI today, and also Guam, which probably everyone's heard of. Um, there's also the American Samoa Island chain over here, part of Samoa. And then there's these other remote islands that we call the Pacific Remote Island Area. Um, those include Wake, Johnston, Palmyra, Kingman, Jarvis, Baker, and Allen. And if you, how many of you have heard of those? If you live here, I guess a lot of people have. So they were some pretty famous sites in World War II. And they're just really, really small, low-lying islands um, that have some turtles there and other wildlife. Um, today I'm mostly going to focus my attention on some of the work we're doing in Hawaii, the Marianas, and American Samoa. And I really just want to give you a flavor of some of the research that we do to try to get at abundance and movement of these animals. Um, oops. I should also say that with, within NOAA fisheries in general, a lot of the science that happens is science to support population assessments. And that's, in particular, that's what we try to do in our program. Um, today, while we have five different species of sea turtles that go through U.S. waters in the Pacific, um, who can tell me what those are? Five species of sea turtles that you can find in U.S. Pacific waters. Kuwabara. Hawksbill, <laughs> green. Okay. Um, all of Ridley, yes. yes. And this woman knows. <laughs> yeah. She's here. <laughs> She's, she's visiting us from the East Coast, Waterhead, volunteer. So yes, we have the five species that pass through at least, but we only have two that are really reef-dwelling species, and they spend a significant portion of their life near shore in environments that are close to us. So today I'm just focusing on those two, um, those two reef-dwelling species. So we have the hawksbill turtle here, and then the green turtle here. Anytime we want to think about doing population studies, we have to think about the life history of an animal. So just some of you might know this um, very well and some not at all, so I just want to go over what the life cycle of a sea turtle is. Um, we know that adult females come up on nesting beaches and they lay eggs. So they'll come up, they'll dig a nest, they'll lay the nest. Say we're talking about green turtles here, maybe there's 100 eggs in that nest. And then that female will go away uh, for a couple of weeks and come back and lay another nest and she might do that maybe three, four, or five times in the season. It varies based on the population and where you are. And then about two months later those eggs are in the sand, they incubate, and uh, two months later you've got hatchlings that are going to break through the eggs, come up to the surface of the sand, and then scurry down to the water. Then once they reach the water, um, but not all of the hatchlings, not all the eggs will produce a hatchling that's viable and make it to the surface of the sand and then not all the hatchlings will make it to the ocean as they're going down. Um, do you guys know what cue they, the turtles follow to, to go the right direction? Yeah, light. So um, they, they follow the strongest light source which sometimes can be a problem if there's uh, light you know, from themselves and things like that. But, so in any case, you've got hatchlings, and they go out into the open ocean, open ocean, and they start doing open ocean feeding pretty much at the surface of the ocean. And then they wander around there, and we call this these years the lost years because we don't know exactly where they go or how they're going, if they're just drifting or if they're um, using their, their swimming abilities. And they stay out in the open ocean for a number of years. Might be a few years, might be up to 10 years. There's some of this that we, even though people have been studying turtles for a long time, we still don't know a lot of the 
the basics if you do not do that. And then after they grow up, um, the, the reef dwelling species that we're talking about today, they get a cue to come back and recruit at a near shore reef environment. So uh, that might happen anywhere between, you know, they might be around 10 years old, 15 years old, we're not exactly sure. If you saw Sean's talk last week, she talked a little bit about trying to figure out how old they are when they come back. So they come back to the reef, and uh, then after that, you've got, um, at some point, they're, they're staying on the reef for a number of years also. So they're eating, they're eating something on these near shore reefs, and that's what they're doing. They're hanging out, they're foraging, and then at some point, you know, maybe 10, 20 years later, they get the urge to go and reproduce. So then they take that cue and they go back to the nesting beach where they were born, or somewhere in the, in the nearby vicinity. And offshore they mate, so the males and the females are there. They mate, they have fertilized eggs, and then the females go up on the beach and they start that whole process over again. So that's kind of what we're dealing with. And that's important because there's all these different life stages to turtles. And in order to try to get at abundance, and habitat use, and movement, to understand um, the different threats that they might face at different life stages, we have to have an appreciation for that. So that's what I want to say there. And um, this, there's important questions when we think about their life history and things that we want to know to figure out how the populations are doing. Those include the abundance of the animals in different life stages. Um, that's just how many animals are there the habitats that they're using, so where are they, are they staying there, are they moving around a lot, and then also the movements, and that could be, we want to know are they going far, you know, long distances, and where are they moving from, and where are they moving to. So a lot of really interesting questions. And today, um, I'm just going to explore a few of the examples from some of our key projects throughout the Pacific Islands region, where we're addressing these types of questions through our research. So first we're going to start in Hawaii, since we're here. People here are probably familiar with the green turtle, so we're going to talk about that. And um, most of what we've done here to think about how many turtles are around is through nesting work. And in Hawaii, we're lucky that we have what we call a closed population, where the turtles are um, both breeding and feeding within the same island chain. So we can get you know, we can really get um, long-term monitoring of turtles and learn lots about them without having to worry about them going to these other places and having to figure out where those other places are. Uh, so, just going to talk about the green turtles today. If you have questions about popsicles afterwards, we can talk about them. And this is a, an example of where we're really kind of focused on the abundance component of um, what I mentioned those three major questions are. We learned about the other aspects too, but today I'm just talking about the abundance. So this is the uh, whole Hawaiian Islands chain, and if you've heard about Hawaii, Hawaiian green turtles and where they nest, you've probably heard of French frigate shoals being a really important place. So French frigate shoals, if you're not familiar, uh, we have the main Hawaiian Islands down here on the lower right. And then as you go all the way up to chain, the chain to Midway, it's way up here, you've got French frigate shoals here in the middle. And this is an area that's the largest atoll of the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. But each little island there is actually pretty small. So you're not, there's not a ton of habitat, but there's a lot of turtle nesting. And just to show you, um, to kind of zoom into what French frigate shoals is, uh, this atoll here, and it has all these little low-lying islands here. Um, East Island is the island that has about half of the green turtle nesters. They go to East Island and they nest there. Um, and the other half are uh, at different little islands within French Great Shoals and Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Also, some nesting here in the main Hawaiian Islands. Um, and that area, if you think about has anyone been to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands? Midway? Did you go to Midway or French Bay? Okay. Where? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Right up there. So the islands are very small um, and they're very remote. Jeff, have you been? Midway. Midway. Okay. So, but they're all kind of similar. Um, there's not much there. 
and it's very remote. But the way that we do research there is we have to send people out to these field camps, which if you like biology and the ocean, it's a pretty incredible thing to go out there and study wildlife without any other people around really. So, so that's what we do. Um, and what I want to show you here is that over years of research being conducted through our program, um, we found out that about you know roughly 96% of all of the green turtles that nest in Hawaii are nesting at French ray shoals, and half of those on East Island. And by putting satellite trackers on them, we've been able to see that the turtles are going, they're making these long distance migrations between French ray shoals and the main Hawaiian Islands. So they're traveling these distances that are up to a thousand kilometers. It's, it's pretty spectacular. When you think about um, just if you had to drive that far between uh, going to sleep and then eating or something. Uh, they don't do it all the time, but it's interesting that they're going that far and it's a you know, biological program going to go that far. So each year we send a field team out to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, and like I said, they live there for a number of months. It might be, it, it all depends on ship time, but they might get dropped off and be there for two or three months, or they might be dropped off and be there for four or five months. So this is, this is a picture here of our team and the two field campers here, um, Olivia and Carrie. They're currently out in, in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands right now living um, at French Creek Shoals, and they're collecting lots and lots of great data for us to continue work that's been done in the past to count all of the turtles there, and also build really good data sets that we can use for um, evaluating how the, the population is doing here in the wild. So we're really excited about that. They're excited. They call us every Thursday on the satellite phone. They tell us how many turtles they've found so far. You know, they're working on uh, the, the nesting turtles primarily, but there's also basking male turtles up there. So it's pretty exciting. That's our crew there. We sent them off on that big white ship and we'll see them in September. Um, so that's pretty exciting. What's that? It's a pack. Yeah. pack of magazine. That's a And then this is East, this is a picture of East Island here. This is where I said 50% of the nesting is occurring. And it's really just this little spit of land in the middle of nowhere, um, but pretty cool if you like seabirds because they're everywhere. Um, there's lots of seabirds around. There's monk seals. You probably might talk about the monk seals a lot. And they set up camp here and they go back and forth between Turn Island, which is the main one there, at Bridge Ridge Hills and Peace Island. And the whole goal, um, especially this year and moving forward, we're really trying to have two people there and we're trying to do what we call saturation tagging. And that's really to try to count every single female that's coming up to nest. And not even just count, but also mark them with, um, I brought some stuff if you want to take a look afterwards, but we put these flipper tags on them, a lot of you are probably aware, but um, we can mark them with flipper tags, and we can also mark them with these pit tags, the passive integrative um, transponder tags. Same kind of equipment pets, and then you can we scan them, and you can get a reading of the number. So, so there's lots of ways for us to tell what individuals what, and then we can use those numbers in population models to figure out how many turtles there are. So the goal here is that they are tagging all of the nesters. Also trying to tag the basking males, because for males, since they don't nest, the only opportunity we have to really study them is when they come up onto the beach to um, bask in the sun. So typically what they're doing in the field is they're using, um, they mark the turtle in several ways. So they'll use this little moto tool thing that etches a number inside the shell. They'll put paint in that, and that's just a temporary marker to keep track of the turtles that you're seeing again and again throughout the season without having to see the flipper tag or see the flipper tag. And then um, also, we, like I said, we've got the metal flipper tags, so those are applied to the turtles, also the pit tags. And then this year we sent up four satellite tags. Um, I'll talk more about satellite tags in a minute, but this is um, something that everyone can take a look at afterwards or pass it around. 
Um, the satellite tags that we put up are a little different, but this is just an example of one. And by putting the satellite tags on them, we're able to get lots of information about where they're going, um, not only between, like from year to year, but also when they come up and nest on the beach, they go offshore, and we want to know where are they going in between every nest that they like, so within the two week period, that kind of thing. There's lots of data being collected up there, and it's exciting for us to get really good information on the demographic parameters for the population. So we call these demo demographic parameters or vital rates, and there are pieces of information that are really important that we use in population models to figure out how the population is doing and how many turtles are out there. So some examples are, you know, they're out there every night, they're counting the number of nesters, looking at the number of eggs per nest, looking at the number of nests that each individual female lays per season, looking at the number of days in between their different nests, so are they coming back every 10 days or 15 or 20, the number of hatchlings that emerge from each nest. So after a turtle lays the, the eggs, uh, the team can come back you know, after the hatchlings come out and they can take a look at which ones remain in the nest and either did not make it out or something like that. Uh, also, the number of years over time, we can track the number of years that uh, one female takes a break. So she typically might go back every four years, but maybe if there's a lot of food and she's doing really well, she'll go back every three years or every two years. Um, or maybe if there's not enough food, she might go back every six years. So each piece of information is a little clue that tells us how the population is doing long term. Um, also, as I mentioned, we're looking at the number of males that are basking. And maybe in the future we'll give a talk here about uh, some information that we're collecting on temperatures. So if you've heard, um, sea turtles, their sex is not determined by chromosomes. It's determined by temperature of the sand in the nest. And so there's these pivotal temperatures where if it's too warm, then you'll get all females or a majority of females. And if it's cooler, then you'll get a better ratio of males to females. So as we think about climate change, these things become important. So we can put data loggers in the nest and also in the sand and other locations over time to get an idea of what the environmental conditions are and how that might affect the population going forward. And all of this work that's being done here for our Hawaiian green turtles has been done, there's been a lot of work done for the past, say, three, four decades. And because of that, we're lucky that we have enough information to put together a population model where we can look at the, the trend and the growth rate of the number of turtles. So here we're looking at from 1975 to 2010, we have some really good, um, or sorry, to 2110. Uh, we have good data here on the number of nesters over that period of time, and then we're able to make a projection as to what that population will do. There's a lot of caveats, and this doesn't consider all the factors, but what it does tell us is that based on what we've seen, the, there's been an increase in the number of nesters of 5% per year. Um, however, that doesn't mean that we're in the clear and we don't need to worry about our combined green turtles, because there's lots of other factors that come into play in. So that's all I want to say about that. And now I'm going to move into the Mariamids archipelago. And I'm talking here about green turtles and possible turtles. Most of what I'm talking about is in water research. So in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, we're really focused on those nesting turtles. But in the Marianas, we have this opportunity to get in the water and try to understand the near shore turtles that are on the um, here, it's a little different than in Hawaii. We've got, you know, let's call it mixed populations where the turtles here are nesting. There are some turtles that nest here, but they may not forage within that same island chain. They may go to a completely different island chain to eat. So that's something that we have to think about as we do research on these turtles. It makes it a little more complicated. And the work that I'm talking about here is going to um, show us how we get some really good data 
on habitat use and also um, long distance movements and how much the turtles are moving around. Part of the project, um, part of the main goals of the project that we have going on in the Marianas is to build capacity with our partners there. So Guam's a territory, we have local government partners there. And because it's a U.S. affiliate territory and also CNMI's uh, compact free association, these are U.S. areas and we're concerned about turtles in U.S. areas. So we want to provide uh, capacity for our partners to do work out there and we want to be able to do it with them. So we're sort of growing, helping them there, do their work, we're help, they're helping us meet our mission of making sure we know what's going on with our turtle resources in different U.S. areas. And by pooling resources, we're able to fulfill different mandates that we have through our environmental laws. Like we have the Endangered Species Act that protects these turtles and NOAA Fisheries has to do research to support um, assessing the populations. Pretty cool, in Guam, we've had the first in-water captures of turtles ever to be done. So we've done that here in Hawaii. Um, it had never been done in Guam for research. And then also in the Marianas, um, we did the first in-water satellite tagging through projects that we've been working on. And the pictures here are with our collaborators there in the field. You'll see more of this guy coming up. Like I his name is Jesse. Um, so what we do when we're out in the Marianas is we do small boat field research. And that means that we take the boat and we do surveys for turtles. We get in the water, we're snorkeling, and we have a local diver there that's very good at free diving and he's able to go down, capture turtles, and then we can do all of our biological sampling and our satellite tagging. Um, the Marianas, if you're not familiar, there's three key islands that I'm talking about here. We have Guam in the south, Tinian, and Saipan. And I want to show you here how much effort we've had in this area. So this has been a project that has been ongoing for the past, uh, say, four, four years, three, four years. And what we've done here is all the black dotted lines show where we've taken the boat and done um, snorkel surveys. And then the red dots here um, show where we've actually captured and satellite tagged turtles. And then the orange is just where we've captured it, but maybe it was too small to put a satellite <laughs> on. Um, and then just observations are in yellow. So you can see that there's definitely some areas um, of sort of hot spots where we found turtles. And coincidentally, this area right here is one of the best coral reefs that I've seen, um, which is pretty cool. You can see turtles hanging around there quite a bit. And then over in Tinian, um, we come down from Saipan and we've surveyed mostly along the west coast of Tinian. Um, just in the last trip that we did, we were able to get over to the northeast area here and also uh, northwest area here to found some pretty exciting spots where turtles are hanging out, especially uh, popsicle turtles, which is, which is fun because they tend to be more rare over there. And then over in Saipan, um, we've gotten kind of around the island. You know, each trip, if there's good weather, we're able to take the boat around to new spots. And then um, we've been pretty successful in getting satellite tags out in the new areas, which is always exciting because we don't, you know, prior to a lot of this research happening, people don't have a good accounting of what's going on with turtles in the areas. So, and they are US affiliated areas. So we don't Uh, okay, this is the part, I have to come over here and click through things, but we have some videos that I want to share. Okay, this first one is how our diver, Jesse Hapte, captures the turtles. So you can see the turtle is right here, and it's free swimming in the water column, which proves very difficult for capturing. If you've ever been close to a turtle, you know they can get out of your way really fast. 
And there you see Jesse coming down. He's just free diving, no scuba. There he has it. He's got the turtle. And he can go down to like 60, 70 feet. Um, now this is atypical because typically he gets them right off the bottom. And that's a lot easier because it's very difficult to capture a turtle free swimming. But this guy is good. Um, and then the turtle is handed off there. And we're on our small boat. The data people are there ready to tag it with all of our equipment. We take a GPS point, get everything ready. And then the divers go back down and they look for more turtles. And eventually, sometimes, we might have like five or six turtles on the boat. It's always exciting, even though this is what we're out there doing. It's like, yay, we caught a turtle. Or Jesse caught a turtle. So this gives you a flavor of what it's like for us when we're out there. So we'll do this, you know, multiple days in a row going out there. It's really, it can be hard on him because he's free diving a bunch to catch every single turtle. So, um, but he's from Yap. So he actually grew up, um, you know, taking turtles for food and then now is a turtle research biologist and works um, on Saipan full time on turtle projects. Now the next one I'm going to show you is just a clip of handing the turtle off. It can be tricky sometimes. Um, for example, this last trip that we were on, he caught a very large male turtle. And it was quite a surprise when they brought it up to the surface, to the boat. And there were two of us and we had to drag that big turtle. It was probably 170 pounds. We had to lift that thing up in the boat. They warned us that it was a big turtle, but um, hard to know until you see it. So then this next one is, um, if you're not familiar with how we, you know, mark the turtles and things like that, I thought it'd be fun to share some of these. So this is now um, tagging the turtle. It's one of the first things we do on the boat so that we can make sure that we're keeping track of them. We also put a, a nail polish number on the turtle so we can tell easily which one they are and what other measurements we need to take on them. Uh, oops. And then just to give you a good look at what that tag looks like. So that was a really good, you know, easy tag. The turtle didn't move. It's right through the skin. Um, and it lasts a long time, hopefully. So it's expected to hang on there for years and years? Yeah, we just heard of one. One of our field campers told us about one they found recently up at French Frigate Shoals. And I can't remember. It was like had one of the original flipper tags from 25 years ago or something like that. Um, and then this is just one of the pit tag. Just going to mute that there. Um, it's just a quick little, you know, needle prick where you put the, it's the size of a rice grain that goes in there and then we're able to scan it and figure out what the number is associated with that. But you can get it, you can get an idea of how it can be challenging to work on a boat on wild animals and yeah so um but it's important because at in this area uh finding the turtles and figuring out what they're doing in the near shore environment this is the only way we can do it um, and then just quickly here we always take a tissue sample and that's useful for um it's it's really quick but it's useful for getting the genetics so we can figure out across the pacific which populations are related to other populations. So that was just super fast. 
and um, and then so as I, I'll pass this around here. But the turtles that we're looking at in the inertial environment in the Marianas, we put these fancy GPS tags out on them. Um, this green area here, this sensor is the GPS uh, location device. And there's also a depth sensor and a temperature sensor right here. Um, and every time the turtle comes to the surface, this antenna shoots a signal out to the satellites. We get all this information um, that we can download online. And also every month we get a disk. And has lots of data, and then we can come up with, we can look at where the turtles go. So, do you guys want to take a look? Take a look at that. Pass that around. Be careful, it's not cheap. <laughs> So we put that on the turtle shell with epoxy, a couple layers, a couple types of epoxy. We do that, we put some anti-fouling paint on it, and then we let it dry. So that whole process might take two hours. And then, and then we let the turtle go and it's happy and swims away. Um, here's one showing a release. There's Jesse on the right, that's the diver. Are they what? Are they oh, um, they might be, but they're probably actually just waiting for um, the camera to be in the water. I have to mute it to avoid some field language. <laughs> like yeah. No, Jeff, we use them all day, every day. So there you can see, it looks like it's a hawksbill. The hawksbills tend to be pretty feisty. So the turtle is obviously ready to go and <laughs> that's Tammy, one of our collaborators. Um, so let's see here. Uh, the releases are really fun, so I'm just going to show another one. Pretty big turtle. It's a hawksbill. So they kept the towel on the head to calm it down. I'm ready, I'm ready. All right, so let's see here. All right, I think I showed you all the videos I wanted to show you there. Um, so now after we put the turtle in the water with the satellite chat on it, it continues to collect data for uh, months to sometimes years. And like I said, it's collecting location data and then also depth and temperature data. And um, from that, we're able to do cool analyses of the data points. And these are really good modern tags. So it's GPS location, which is really cool. The older tags would have a different system of calculating where you're know, kind of triangulating based on satellites. And they were less um, accurate. And so this is really neat that we can find out within a reef where the turtles are hanging out um, and how much they're moving. So just quickly. 
in Guam, here's two examples, green turtles and hospital turtles. Every little black point is one GPS location from a turtle that we put a satellite tag on in that area. On the left here for green turtles, we've got 11 turtles uh, that were tagged in this image. They, they had an average size of 56 centimeters of their carapace length. Um, the tag life, it, they lasted an average of 151 days, and we still currently have one out of those 11 transmitted. We recently put more out there, so we're always updating this as we go and then looking at the data to learn what we can. And then over here, hospital turtles, all the GPS locations. Um, this is just two turtles, they're a little bigger, and the tags last longer, so 197 days. Um, and out of this, we have one active tag still. So then we can do some fancy statistics. This is called a kernel density estimate, and it basically looks at the uh, concentration of points where, where they're concentrated in that area. And so the darker shading tells you they hang out there a lot. And at the next layer, if we kind of do some outlines here, in yellow is outlined the 50% uh, kind of core area where most 50% of the points occur. And then the blue line is 95%. So basically we can say the 95% area is like the habitat range, all the areas that they use, and there's a few outliers. And then the yellow is the core area that's like they're there all the time. So what's really cool about this is if you look at the scale bars in these in these uh, images here, they're zero, they're zero to two kilometers. So these turtles, when they settle down on a reef, like I was talking about before, they go and they stay there, and they might stay there for up to 20 years or something, and they don't really move. They stay within the same kilometer area on these reefs, and you can see them time after time. We put these satellite tags on them. They've been captured, um, but you know you might think, oh, they're going to take off, and we're not going to see them. Nope. You can see them. You know, even within the same trip, we'll see them in the exact same spot as they were when they got captured. The first time. So they really have these core areas. Um, they use. And then just another example for Saipan, so there were the three islands. For Saipan, same kind of pattern. Um, they're really only using a one to two kilometer area of reef. So they just hang out there for a lot of years. Um, this one's interesting. This These hospitals have had tags on for 896 days, so that's over a couple of years. Pretty amazing. And that's because of a characteristic of their shell in a little tough coat. And then here we are with Tinian. Now, interesting here is what I'm going to tell you about next. We've, we've got three hospitals that were tagged over here. Um, they're all still active. And when they're in this area, they're just doing the same thing as what I showed you. They have their little reef, they hang out there, they don't go too far. But then, eventually, they go pretty far. And this is pretty cool because we didn't know any of this until we started putting tags on them. Um, and I'll show you about that in just a second. So overall, by working with the turtles in the near shore environment, we've gotten a good idea between our work and work with our collaborators in the Marianas. We've gotten a good idea of what we call population structure. So how many animals there are at different size classes and kind of how long they're staying on the reef. What this shows you here, this is a, a length frequency plot, so it tells you the size of the turtle here, so 40 to 80 centimeters, and then how many turtles have been captured that have that length. So you can see most of the turtles that have been captured are kind of in this uh, 40 to 60 range. What we see is for hawksbills and green turtles, we don't capture a lot of turtles that are less than, say, 35 centimeters. So before that, they're out in the open ocean doing their wash years. They're eating, they're, they haven't settled to a reef yet. But then um, we start catching them 35 centimeters up until for hawksbills in the ground. We catch them until they're about 62 to 65 centimeters. But then where do they go? They're, we're not catching, we're not seeing a lot of bigger turtles. So what's up with that? And then for green turtles, they're a little bigger than the hospital. So we see those in the near shore environment that are up to maybe 78 centimeters. Um, 
So this is pretty cool because through the research, we're getting a really good understanding of the near shore turtles there. Through the tags, we're figuring out where they go, and then through genetics, we're figuring out how they're related to other Pacific populations. Um, and one thing we've done an estimate here, and we've estimated that these turtles stay in that that reef zone around the Marianas for maybe 15 to 20 years. So it's, it's pretty cool. And they're in they're 15 to 20 years within that one little kilometer area. So they don't they don't travel much. Now I mentioned that the hawksbills they're staying on the reefs, but then um, through this the tag we've been able to see that they actually go to some pretty cool places. Uh, it's still pretty lucky. So they got tagged on Tinian. Um, we've got two turtles showing here. One track going this way, one track going over here. On the left here, this turtle was tagged in August 2013. However, it moved down here a couple months later and it's been hanging out in Guam for, um, since 2013. So that's a pretty far distance. The scale here, that's 100 kilometers. So it's a few hundred kilometers. It's just changed islands and so it's probably nesting in one and then foraging in the other. Then this, this turtle was tagged July 2014. Um, it stayed until the following spring in April. And then it left and started making a move. And it, it arrived somewhere in July of 2015. So any guesses on where the turtle went? Where? So it's going kind of east, south and east from the Marianas. Do you know? Hawaii? Hawaii? Yes, yes, maybe. Samoa? <laughs> um, okay, so where it went, this is zooming out, and this is the whole track of the turtle. So there was the one that went to Guam, and then here's the one that went all the way down south. Um, it went down to Federated States of Micronesia, to Hana Bay. Uh, and looking at that zooming in to that migration track, this scale bar is 500 kilometers here. So that turtle swam 1,600 kilometers um, over, you know, with all the zigzags, over 2,000 kilometers travel. And typically, hawksbills all around the world are only known to travel between 18 and 345 kilometers. So this is pretty exciting because what we've learned from putting one of those tags out is that we may have documented the longest migration ever for hawksbill turtles. Um, and then what's it doing down here? We don't know. Uh, however, what we do know is it's actually not at, so this is Ponape, which is a main island in FSM. And it's actually over here at this place called Ant Atoll. And that happens to be a uh, biosphere preserve, which is pretty cool. So the hospital left Tinian, traveled really far, and now it's in a marine protected area. I don't I don't know anything about the enforcement there, but it's pretty cool. And um, it's doing the same thing as as they do over in the other in the Mariana. So it's just staying along the same reef. But the cool thing is that we don't really know if it's foraging in the Marianas and then going down and nesting at FSM. But our diver, Jesse, he's from FSM. And so he's told us there definitely is possible nesting here. So that's a possibility. Or it could be foraging down here and then nesting up in the Mariana. So we're getting new information, which is always exciting. Uh, that was the hospital, and, but I just want to show you one, one more map here, I think, for the Marianas, which is uh, through our partners there, Jesse and Tammy, you saw videos of both of them. They are on top of it, on Saipan, and Tinian and Groda, and they're tiny green turtle nesters. So they get way, way uh, lower numbers than we get here in Hawaii. But they're able to go out there and put satellite tags on them. Um, so one thing we've learned from that is that the green turtles that nest there, so not the ones that we're catching in the water, really, they're kind of two populations. Those ones are moving all the way over to Japan, the Philippines, and all the way through almost to Malaysia. Um, so that is migration of 2,500 to 3,000 kilometers. So it's interesting because those turtles are going to the west, and then the turtles that um, you know we're still looking to see where the turtles are going that we're tagging. Um, actually, those ones are going to be like this. So 
Anyway, there's lots of movement, and it's different between the green turtles and the hawksbills, and by putting the tags on, we're able to see what they're doing. And then it's also important because we don't know what kinds of threats they're facing through fisheries, through poaching in different areas. When they get to these different places, what, what's happening in those areas? Um, so then we can think about focusing on conservation efforts um, based on knowing their full life cycle. Um, I think I'm going to skip this. If you want to know about the genetics of the populations, ask me afterwards. Now, just quickly, um, we also are doing work in American Samoa. And the work that we're doing there is mostly focused on green turtles. There are some hawksbills there, too. But there's nesting at a place called Rose Atoll, which is also a wildlife refuge. And so we send people there to do nesting beach work, similar to what we do at French Brigade Shoals. And this is another case, though, where it's kind of a mixed population. So the nesters. You know, we want to figure out where are they going and the turtles in the water, where are they coming from. Um, so we're doing similar studies there. Now this is what it looks like when you're working on a nesting beach. You've got to put the corral around the turtle. Uh, the satellite tags are typically smaller when they don't have the GPS locator on there. They just have the satellite um, system going. And here is a photo of actually putting the anti-fouling paint on the satellite tag after it's attached. And then the turtle's released and it can swim so you know, halfway back to uh, back offshore and then it's probably doing some more mating and coming back and next thing. So what we've learned from putting satellite tags on the turtles in American Samoa is that they are similarly making long distance movements, which is pretty interesting. And here are two tags that were put on in um, on this December 5th, 2013, and then they both went west over to Fiji, actually. Um, and the last signal there was in 2014, like yeah, six months later, and then um, eight months later. So these turtles are taking you know six, eight months to cruise over and hang out in Fiji, and that's where they're foraging. So they're on the reefs there. When they get that bridge to go back and reproduce, they're going to come back this way and we'll keep tagging them there, figuring out how many there are and what they're doing. And that is a distance of 1,500 kilometers. So it's pretty, pretty far, that old finding Nemo thing with the turtle all the way. It's like, there's a trick to it. Um, and then this is just another example. After you know training the partners there in American Samoa, they put out more tags and um, this just shows a couple more tracks. One of them, the turtle was headed toward Vanuatu, and then one went all the way over to Australia. It was probably hanging out on the Great Barrier Reef. So um, it's pretty exciting to see how far they go, and then to think about what we can do to understand them and protect them in different places. Now, remote islands, I just want to mention. There's green turtles there and hostile turtles there. As I mentioned before, it's really hard to get to even just French Brigade Shoals, which is within our same island chain. So it's even more difficult to get to these places that are even further. Right now, we don't have a lot of research um, in place to do the same types of work that I talked about in the other areas. But what we do have is our coral reef ecosystem program takes a ship all around the Pacific and does toad diver surveys, and there if but they're looking for fish and coral, and they do a lot of documentation of that. And they also collect data on turtles, too. So from those data, we're able to look at how many times they've gone there and where they see turtles. So we can start to piece together at least relative abundance of how many turtles are in different, in the different locations. So hopefully I've given you some flavor of the type of work that we do to understand um, these populations and the information that goes into the population assessments, it's all science that's important for uh, informing our policymakers and our managers and people who work on the Indigenous Species Act and making sure that our turtles are protected. So, with that, any questions? Thank you all very much for showing up on Sunday.
what is Jesse number that turtles are? Does he use a fish finder like people who buy some electronic stuff? That's a great question. No, he just goes out there and snorkels and knows, you know, he just has a lot of knowledge based on where, where he thinks the turtles will be, their habitat, uh, time of day, locations. He's in the water all the time. So, no, it's really just he sees it. And sometimes you don't even, you know, you'll be right next to him and you won't see it, but he sees it. With climate change and associated sea level rise, how high off the, how high above sea level are some of these places? Not very high. So, um, one thing that you would expect would is the sea level rise. A lot of the low lying atoll beaches, you're probably going to see nesting habitat loss. So there's not enough space to do all the nesting. Um, turtles may go somewhere else, or they may nest in the same spot, but dig up other nests while they're doing it. So a turtle may come and lay. There's not enough space, and the other turtle may come and dig up that nest while she's laying. And then a, a huge thing would be with sea level rise you've got, um, and also with more frequent storms and things like that, you're probably going to get more inundation of the nest with water. So um, that could lead to mortality of the embryos. Um, there's also issues with temperature change in the water as well. So one of the reasons um, that there was a recent status review of global green turtle populations, and that status review concluded, after the status review, the managers looked at all the science, and they said, we're going to keep the Hawaiian green sea turtle listed as threatened. Um, some people were interested in taking it off. So they left it as threatened, but 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 the thing is that um, the numbers look good for nesting. Nesting's going up, but that's only one part of the story. Habitat loss um, from sea level rise is an issue, and if you remember what I said, you've got almost all of the green turtles in Hawaii nesting at French Creek Shoals, a low lying atoll that could you know, disappear. Um, and you, we can't predict what the turtle would do. They might find other places to nest. Predators taking nests. Predators? Yeah. Uh, uh, we get raccoons and yeah. all kinds of things. Yeah. Are we going to be swimming on them or other kinds of places? There's no, um, I don't think there are any unnatural predators in the northwestern line. You've got seabirds, so seabirds definitely. Um, in Guam, in the Marianas, well, in Guam, there's a brown tree snake. I think, I'm not sure if that's an issue at all, actually. I can't really speak to that. But there's also feral animals. So you've got, same as in the main white island, you've got cats and dogs. And uh, you know, here we have all these there. I don't remember what they have. Yeah, definitely an issue in some locations. Yeah, I was wondering about the uh, fiber Oh, FP. Um, so fibro-papilloma is a disease that turtles have had in Hawaii and also in Florida. It's the, the disease, it's a herpes virus, and so it causes tumors, if you see. Um, sometimes we'll be out snorkeling and we'll see a turtle with big tumors, and it's kind of sad. The disease in general um, shot up. You know, in previous decades, there was higher incidence of it in Hawaii. However, I think the current consensus is that it's not as much of a problem. It seems to have plateaued in terms of the, the way that we gauge that is the number of strains that we get with FP. Um, so I think my understanding is that people, researchers, are not um, as concerned about it right now with the healthy looking population increasing. And uh, yeah, and, and so it may be kind of controlling itself. But we'll see. Any other questions?